The Supreme Court justice has sold us out. These are being stolen. Corporations are all of a sudden people. We the people? Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk and I'm your host today. Today our guest is Bruce Gagnon. Uh, Bruce is the Secretary Coordinator for the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, which he helped to co-found in 1994. Uh, he is a Vietnam veteran and began his, pro his career working with the United Farm Workers Union in Florida, organizing fruit pickers. Uh, and he is an active member of Veterans for Peace. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Great. So tell us what the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power, nuclear power in Space is. Actually created in 1992. Uh, this is our 20th year of operation. And we are an a, a international organization whose job it is, is to try to prevent the arms race from moving into space. The aerospace industry has been bragging over the years that uh, this idea of Star Wars, as we generically call it, will be the largest industrial project in the history of the planet Earth, necessitating their defunding, they say, of the entitlement programs, which in America officially are Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and what's left of the welfare program. So we're a very determined organization of about 150 affiliated groups around the world trying to prevent uh, the militarization, the nuclearization, and the weaponization of space. Hmm. Okay, all right. And, and you do this work from a peace activist perspective, is that right? That's right. Uh, I became a peace activist during the Vietnam War. I uh, came from a military family. My dad was in the Air Force, and I was a young Republican for Nixon in 1968. So for Nixon? That's right. Okay. I was uh, in the uh, panhandle of Florida. I was working on the Nixon campaign uh, with the Young Republican Club at that time. Uh, but when I joined the military in 1971, I became a peace activist. I've been one ever since, and uh, have been working in the peace movement since 1983. Uh, with f first with the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice as the state coordinator. And it was in that job that we began looking at the space program that was so near to us, uh, centered there at the Space Center at NASA. And uh, we realized that uh, they had big plans for essentially control of the Earth using space technology to the benefit of corporate globalization for these corporations that have begun to take control not only of our government, but literally governments all over the world, drowning democracy, not just in this country, but all over the planet, especially as resources become scarce around the world, oil, natural gas, water, minerals. Uh, we're seeing more and more of a drive to control these places and using space technology as a key uh, system in order to carry this program out. Great. Now, actually, on, on the news last night, uh, there was a story about some of the very richest people in the world who combined into a single corporation uh, with the purpose of of mining asteroids, uh, and uh, I thought that was just very interesting. Uh, the The commentary that went with the story said that um, they probably are the only people that could do such a thing because they have such tremendous wealth. And it just brought to my mind that we're talking about corporations doing something that probably the nations of the world don't have enough wealth to do. Well, you know, actually, when you think about it, it's the taxpayers that paid all the years of research and development since World War II when the Space Command was created. All those years of research and development that made it possible to launch rockets, to send rockets and rovers to Mars, for example. On Mars, they're driving these rovers around today doing soil identification, and they're mapping the surface of those planetary bodies. And they say they're doing it because they're looking for the origins of life, but actually they are looking for resources. They believe there's magnesium and cobalt and uranium on Mars, helium-3 and water on the moon, and gold on the asteroids. People say, you know, if we continue living the way we do here on the Earth, we'll need six planets mm -hmm. to provide us the resources. And these folks 
have said, yeah, we found those six planets, and now we're going to go out and mine them. But you, the taxpayers, paid all the years of research and development to create these technologies. But now that it gets to the point where you can begin to successfully start the process of mining, they're privatizing it. That's what Obama has done since he became president. He's begun to privatize NASA in a bigger way, turning over a lot of these missions. And in fact, they're even writing law that says when the day comes that they can successfully mine the sky for these precious uh, resources, they want to make it tax exempt, make the profits from these corporations tax free. And mm. so this is all being put in place today. So, so they're going to make, make it all tax exempt so that we don't benefit, they benefit, in spite of the fact that we have it has been at our expense that all of this technology and this knowledge has been put in place in the first That's place. That's right. right. They haven't yet passed this law to make it tax exempt, but they're working on it. They're also trying to re -re rewrite international space law. The uh, U UN Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Treaty specifically say that no country, no corporation, no individual can own the planetary bodies. And so these same uh, interests, these same aerospace corporations are now trying to rewrite international space law so that they can claim ownership of the planetary bodies. So it's going to be a major source of conflict in the future. And in fact, one of the jobs of the Space Command at the Pentagon is to develop the weapons technology to give uh, the U.S. control of the pathway on and off the planet Earth, what they call the Earth-Moon gravity well, and so that we would be able to decide who could go out and mine the sky in the future, whether you were authorized or not so that we would pick and choose who can do that. In fact, in a planning document written for the Congress by a congressional staffer some years ago called Military Space Forces the Next 50 Years, they lay out this whole plan. It's really, really amazing. They're working very far ahead of us, and few of us know much about what's happening. Great. Yeah. So you're one of the few people that actually continues to talk about the military-industrial complex, and that's a term which you know, when I was a kid, uh, was talked about, but I, I really haven't heard it until I heard you um, use the term in your talk here in Portland a couple of days ago. So wh wh why, do you, why do you continue to talk about the military-industrial complex? Well, because it's the centerpiece of all U.S. corporate strategy today. The Pentagon is now the military arm of corporate globalization. Corporate globalization's main job today is to go out around the world and take control of the declining resources. Again, the oil, the water, the, the natural gas, the minerals that are used to build computers and cell phones, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and particularly, uh, uh, the Pentagon has been given the job essentially as a resource extraction service to the benefit of corporate globalization. And the Pentagon is saying that we're not going to have jobs in America anymore. We're not going to make things anymore. Our role under corporate globalization will be security export. So while the Occupy movement and Move to Amend are working on trying to limit corporate power, what I believe they need to include in their articulation that they've not yet done is to begin to see how the military industrial complex, which is taking control of our national resources, $1.4 trillion a year uh, so-called security budget. 60% out of every discretionary tax dollar goes to the Pentagon today. Uh, we've got to begin to see how the military, how the Pentagon is, in fact, the arm of these corporate uh, interests that are now drowning our democracy. Mm -hmm. So this connection is not being ad adequately uh, made uh, as we are connecting the dots on so many other issues today. Mm -hmm. Okay. And has, has Occupy uh, talked about uh, military industrial complex or have they really focused on uh, the consequences of you know, excessive military spending? In some cases, in some noble exceptions, yes. Uh, in D.C., where there's been a uh, Occupy uh, in, in, uh, in Washington, there have been two different Occupy sites. One of them in particular has, was created to make this very connection to the military. And in some scattered cases in other parts of the country, it has. But in, in the main, in most cases, the Occupy movement has not done that. And I think this is a real, a real lack because clearly, uh, the military is being used by the corporations to not only militarize and control the world, 
but even increasingly we see in our own size in our in our own, in our own country we see the way occupy was it was uh, dealt with by essentially a military machine in America shutting it down in the fall and through the winter uh, so we see the militarization of our own society now as these corporations want to control us in, in America, want to limit our access to democracy. So uh, we've got to talk about militarization in all the aspects. And everything that is done with the military today is coordinated by space technology. Mm -hmm. With the military satellites in place, they fly drones that are going to be used to spy on us. That, that uh, The police, uh, as they do a lot of their operations, are going to be hooked up increasingly increasingly to military satellites. So mm -hmm. we've got to begin to see this very vital connection. Mm -hmm. and, and then I have recently uh, read about uh, some new technologies with regard to sound, uh, blasting, like demonstrations, so it'll dis be dispersed. And I, I can't quite remember if it was sound or something, maybe you know some more yeah, detail. Yeah, there are different, right. many different technologies being developed, but sound that would pierce the ears, eardrums, uh, it would make your uh, head feel like it was going to explode, so you run. Uh -huh. uh, it's a crowd control device. Uh, other uh, directed energy beams that heat the water in your body, you know, we're mostly oh, right. water, uh, and your body feels like it's on fire because the water gets heated up, and so again, you run and escape, so it's, a, again, crowd control mechanisms. These were tested uh, in Iraq uh, against the Iraqi people. Uh, and a lot of times in our wars, we test these new technologies. The uh, first Persian Gulf War, for example, was where they first field tested the entire space control and war fighting apparatus. So they use these, these wars not only to make money, to expend shells, to control people, to, to grab resources, but also to test these new technologies. Okay. All right. Yeah, how is this grand scheme different than what we've done militarily in the past? Well, I think it's uh, like uh, you know uh, the past on steroids. It's the past uh, at a whole new level, a whole new technological level. And in addition to that, <coughs> we see added to this uh, the dissolution of social progress in America as uh, public education will be privatized. Uh, increasingly social programs being destroyed so the money can be moved over into this militarization of our society. So we see it's a double-edged sword now. We have neo-feudalism here at home and this increased militarization of our culture. So I say to people all the time, you know, if you want to fight against endless war, if you want to fight against this militarization of space, if you want to fight against uh, the control of us by the military here at home fight for social progress because it's like two trains heading for a collision one of them called corporate domination of the world backed up with the this military space technology program what the, the space command uh, enumerated in their planning document vision for 2020 and the other train is called social progress they're heading for a collision course one of them has to be derailed and it's an open question as to which the American people uh -huh. are going to, uh, uh, you know, support in the yeah. end. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you think it's worthwhile trying to make political change, or, or does Occupy or Occupy kinds of uh, actions need to ramp up so they more clearly confront? I think we have to do everything. We have to work every angle we can. We have to work every uh, avenue we can, but I think we have to end our illusions. We, at the time has come for us to end our illusions that we're living in a real democratic society where we have open and free elections. I mean, I know your work around Move to Amend and trying to get the money out of the, out of the hands of the corporations so they can't control our democracy. That's vital work, but we have to really begin to understand uh, how these corporations today control the country, control the democracy, and that it becomes increasingly difficult in, in traditional ways to make reform happen in America. And so that increasingly I think we have to use direct action, nonviolent resistance against this situation. Uh, our organization has been working with people on Jeju Island in South Korea for some time where they're resisting the construction of a Navy base that the U.S. is going to use to help surround China. 
uh, as we try to control China in the coming period. Uh, and the people there, uh, I'm really uh, taken by the South Korean peace community because they've been dealing with essentially fascism for many, many years. They know what it looks like, what it smells like, and they know how to respond to it. Uh, and when you go there and see how they nonviolently confront their totalitarian government that has a national security law that allows them to do whatever they want with the people, uh, we're now beginning to see those things happen to us in this country. I like to say we're now being brought onto the reservation, if you will, mm -hmm. and we need a whole new understanding of what it's going to take in terms of resistance against this. Uh, we can't just idly go on the way we've been going. Right. And so you, you uh, alluded to uh, American plans to surround China, um, and uh, I, I think that those plans also include surrounding Russia. That's right. Um, can, can you just give us some additional details about how that's happening or what the mechanisms are? Well, Russia today has the world's largest supply of natural gas and significant supplies of oil. And again, I ask this question, uh, isn't it clear that by now that the Pentagon's primary job is to serve as a resource extraction service? So today the U.S. Pentagon and uh, NATO uh, is expanding, NATO is expanding eastward into the former Warsaw Pact bloc of the Soviet Union. Uh, now moving into Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, right on the Russian border. The U.S. is surrounding Russia with so-called missile defense systems on land and at sea. At the same time, we're surrounding Russia, again, with these missile defense systems that are part of U.S. first strike planning. And in fact, uh, the Pentagon, the Space Command, has been wargaming a first strike attack on China, uh, set in the year 2016 for the last few years. Why are we surrounding China? Well. We've made the determination in the United States, I say we, I'm talking about the corporate elite, the uh -huh. oligarchy, the military industrial complex, they've made the decision that we're not going to be able to compete with China economically in the years ahead. But if we control China's access to resources, then we will be able to manage them. In 2001, the Washington Post had an article entitled, For the Pentagon, Asia moving to the forefront. And the article said that the United States was going to double its military presence in the coming years in the Asia Pacific region in order to control China. And so Obama, just a couple months ago, announced a pivot of U.S. and foreign policy into Asia Pacific. He then went to Australia, where he negotiated a deal to send 2,500 Marines to Darwin in the north of Australia. And we are now doubling our military presence in that region. So Obama is carrying out a program that is long ago developed within the, the military industrial complex, within the corporate oligarchy to surround and control China. As it turns out, China imports 60% of their oil on ships through the Yellow Sea and Jeju Island just south of the Korean Peninsula that will become a Navy base for U.S. warships sits essentially at the mouth of the Yellow Sea, a very strategic location just 300 miles from the coast of mainland China. Well, this is a very provocative, dangerous strategy that the United States is now embarking on and is going to make J the people of Jeju Island, a target, a 400-year-old fishing and farming community where people are struggling to resist this base, and uh, we've been doing everything we can to support them. Okay, all right. And then in terms of Russia, what, what has happened with Russia? There was uh, this missile defense system that we had talked about under Bush. Uh, I, I think that most people would think that that probably went away. Is that the case? Well, when Obama came into office, he announced that he was not going to deploy uh, Bush's version of missile defense. It was made by Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Instead, soon thereafter, Obama announced that he was going to escalate a version of missile defense that is primarily based on Navy Aegis destroyers, warships, uh, with these missile defense systems. It is made by General Dynamics. As it turns out, uh, General Dynamics is predominantly owned by the Crown family of Chicago, who helped Obama become president. They collectively gave him $500,000 in his campaign in 2008, and they also raised money for him within the military-industrial complex, 
before that election. After that election, when he won, I read in one of the industry publications, Aviation Week and Space Technology, that in fact Obama received more campaign donations from the military industrial complex in 2008 than even the right wing war hawk John McCain did. Mm. So clearly Obama is now rewarding general dynamics and it's interesting that the cost per Aegis destroyer warship just went from 1.5 billion dollars each to a new version under Obama that the Navy didn't even want because it was so expensive they're now going to be between four and seven billion dollars per copy. Obama telling the Navy they have to build wow. this version. Uh -huh. Right, and, and this is part of, of the plan for encircling Russia? That's is, right, is that right? Yeah, okay. Russia and China, uh -huh. yeah. Right. Both of them are being encircled with these missile defense systems that very quickly their job is to, after you hit them in a first strike, they try to launch a, their remaining nuclear retaliatory capability and your missile defense shield, as it's called, picks off those remaining uh, missiles that you didn't get in your first strike, you take them out for a successful first strike attack. And again, this is being annually war-gamed at the U.S. Space Command. Uh -huh. Okay. And, and so, how, how does the Arctic uh, fit into this? Because my, my feeling is that is that as the Arctic uh, melts uh, and you get more shipping in those areas, it, it's I, I'm under the impression there's some kind of a treaty uh, about not militarizing that area. Well, increasingly you're right. As the Arctic melts and they can get to the oil that they say is under the sea in the Arctic, it now becomes a, a serious area for competition. And so any existing treaties or agreements that, that uh, demilitarize those zones are now on the way out. And the U.S. is working with Canada and Norway and its other allies in the Arctic regions to, to make claims on those Arctic uh, uh, oil and natural gas deposits, of course, this puts them in conflict with Russia, who has a vast Arctic uh, area above their country. So this is indeed going to be one of the major areas of conflict in the future. Uh -huh. And that's one reason why the U.S. is moving a lot of these Aegis warships up into the Black and the Baltic Seas today. Mm -hmm. okay. you, you, you mentioned about Obama going to Australia, and it's brought up to my mind one of the things that the Alliance for Democracy has been working on is opposing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and uh, Australia is a major component of that. So, you know, as we're talking about this pivot uh, that Obama is making to focus on the Pacific, this Trans-Pacific Partnership then becomes part of that larger picture. Yeah, that's uh, right, yeah. 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 So, uh, how, how is nuclear power coming out of the U.S. Department of Energy labs connected to uh, the plans for, for use in space? Well, as we were earlier talking about this idea of mining the sky, oh, yes. the nuclear industry has viewed space as a new market. And they say, okay, if we're going to mine the moon or if we're going to mine Mars, then we can have nuclear-powered mining colonies on these planetary bodies. And we can even have nuclear rockets with nuclear reactors for engines to get us to Mars, which takes a year to get to with conventional rockets. But with a nuclear reactor on board, it would cut in half the amount of time. Uh -huh. And so you can imagine a whole host of launches with nuclear devices that blow up on occasion. It becomes a massive environmental problem. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that, uh, that just about concludes our time. Do you have, have any closing thoughts? Um, well, well I, uh, l let me ask you this: w What what specifically could people do to oppose this uh, this march toward the militarization of space? It, well, and, and I would say the mul and, and the militarization of the entire planet. Yep. We need a, a unifying demand within our progressive community, a, a, a demand that benefits labor and the environmental groups, the peace movement, and others. And I think that unifying dem demand is the conversion of the military industrial complex. When we take money out of the Pentagon and we build rail systems or we build a solar society, we're going to create more jobs, we're going to help reduce our uh, carbon footprint around the world. We have to remember that the Pentagon is the world's biggest polluter with the world's biggest carbon footprint. So if the environmental community is serious, about calling for uh, ways to solve for climate change. They've got to begin to take on the Pentagon. We've got to move that money out of the Pentagon so that we can do the good things we need in our society like health care, public education, and sustainable technologies to deal with the coming ravages of climate change. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks Bruce. for having me. Okay.
Okay. Right. So we've been talking with Bruce Gagnon, who is the Secretary Coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more by visiting our website, www.thealliancefordemocracy.org, or our Portland site, www.afd-pdx.org. Thank you to our crew. Our crew today is Roger Bates, Dave King, Janet Morris, Joan Horton, and Tom Thomas. Thanks to you, to the audience, for watching, and we hope that you'll, we hope that we'll see you again next week.